Hi, this is uh, Jay Horror, which was a special edition of the Amazing Mental Love Mike podcast. My special guest is my longtime friend, Mike Francesa. Mike, if you had begun, like in March, if you thought that the Yankees and the Mets would be the first teams to 20 wins in the leagues, would you would it be crazy? And what do you, how does that happen? You know, I, I would never be crazy uh, about the Yankees being, you know, uh, in that position. If he had told me that the DeGrom news would be what it was, I'd be very surprised by the Mets. And the Mets have gotten really sensational starting pitching. I mean, not that Scherz is a surprise, he's not. I mean, he's a great pitcher and he's been able to carry his greatness and his durability amazingly deep into his career, which makes him, you know, really a legendary pitcher. Uh, but they've gotten such tremendous pitching, you know, uh, really everywhere. But especially in the starting pitching, I mean, for most of the time through the first 30 games, they had the number one ERA in baseball. I mean, they were setting records through 15 games. So uh, it's been remarkable. And they've gotten timely hitting. They haven't all hit, but they've hit in big spots, which has been, uh, I think, uh, you know, you know, Marte hasn't hit a lot, but he's gotten some big RBIs. Obviously, Alonzo's uh, off to a tear with the RBIs. So uh, they've gotten big hits. And... They're well managed, you know. Let's be honest. Buck's done a great job. You know, Buck. We go way back with Buck. I go back with Buck to the days of Billy Martin. So, and I know you do too. So we go way back with Buck. And if anyone is surprised that Buck's a great manager, they shouldn't be because we've known for a long time that he's a great manager. Mike, did you work with him? Uh, did shows when he was a Yankee manager? Yeah, when no, we didn't do shows with him a lot uh, when he was the Yankee manager, it was before um, he was we we did i'm trying to remember if we did a year with him or not uh i don't think we did i don't i don't think we did at that time uh we have a weekly show with him but he came on all the time with us anyway so yeah. he was a fixture on our show wherever he was so going back to before he even became a manager uh we knew him pretty well so you know you got to remember he was as fans might not know, he was Billy's eye in the sky going back a million right, years. You know, that. Billy brought him into baseball, uh, and he was Billy's boy, which wasn't the best thing to be all the time no. either, was Billy's boy. Uh, but he was always a very smart baseball guy. You know, I always compared him a little bit to Van Gundy in that um, the way they came into the, li into the limelight – they were kind of guys who came out of nowhere, and all of a sudden you realize they were really good at what they did, and then they could stand on their own and become very, very good at what they did. So he, he always reminded me, the two of them, I know both of them very, very well, they remind me of each other a little bit. Like this year, the Subway Series could be special. You went through 2000, the first one. What would it mean to the, to the city, you know, to have this happen again, you know, 22 years later? You know, the funniest thing, Jay, um, and... Jay was such a central part of every day, you know, as was Mike and the Mad Dog, you know, which was for 20 years and then me for 13 more after Dog. But um, so I dealt with Jay and dealt with the, the, you know, the Mets and the Yankees, we dealt with them every day. I mean, it was really no off day for the whole year. You know that, Jay. But the thing that surprised me the most in all the years, I always – wanted a subway series we always wanted to make it like it was the 50s again you know so that we could relive the 50s dog and i used to always say boy it would have been great to be around when it was willie mickey and the duke and you had three teams and your arguments and this and that the most disappointing big event in the all the time i in the 30 plus years that i did the show the most disappointing big event ever was the subway why series. do you say that it did not live up at all to what we thought it would be. It never captured the imagination of the city like we thought it would. Not the way the Knicks did, not the way the Giants did when they were on fire, not the way the Yankees did with the pink Cadillac even, yeah. or the Mets in 86. It never did, and there was a couple of reasons why. The biggest reason was, I think, the approach the Yankees had and the approach Steinbrenner had. Steinbrenner thought of it being such a curse if he was going to lose to the Mets that he made it so uncomfortable for the Yankees. They didn't enjoy any of that. They never had fun with the Subway Series. And let's be honest, you know this better than anybody, Jay. 
they shut down pretty much during the Subway series as far as interviews. They didn't do a lot. The Mets... I know some of your players complained about having to do interviews every day, yeah, and indeed. you were accommodating. The Yankees were very hard to deal with. Even Torrey, who was never hard to deal with, was hard to deal with during that series because Steinbrenner made things so difficult because he just couldn't even fathom. The Yankees were tight. They were tight. They were cranky, and they never enjoyed it. And, you know, that series has always been very poorly represented for this reason. The Mets were a couple of plays away. Five runs. Well, the Timo Perez base running. Run, Timo, run. The Benitez <laughs> walked to yeah. O'Neill. Yes. Uh, you know, in game two, Jay Payton makes it 6-5 with yeah. the three-run homer off Mariano. I mean, the games at City Field, you know, the Louis So 9,000 bounce hit, base hit. I mean, the it easily could have been a classic series. I, I thought, you know, we, we, we won 90-plus games, and... We were, that team has really been not respected at all. No, and you did. got a lot out of a lot of guys who weren't great players. Right. That was pretty amazing. Yeah, Bobby did a great job. Really, he has, really has did. Really great. He did. You've been a, a, always been a proponent of Buck. I mean, as somebody who's been in the PR, the profession, how important it is to have the manager have the command in the locker room that he does, and and, and the meaning and everything. In this town, enormous. In this town, it is. In some cities, I don't think it's that big a deal, and I think. Baseball managers probably have less impact on their team winning and losing than any other sport. Football is enormous. Hockey, basketball are bigger than baseball. Baseball manager, you can get by without a great one. But when you put it in a town where it's a pressure cooker, the manager in Boston makes a big difference. The manager in Philly makes a big difference. The manager in New York makes a huge difference because there's a lot of pressure playing here. We're very intense about our baseball. We live it day to day. You know how hard that we can be as a media on the players day to day. Hey, you know this, Jay. I mean, go back to the days of Kevin McReynolds. Yes. I mean, how on Kevin McReynolds we made his life so uncomfortable. Yeah. How many players did J Greg Jeffries go down yeah. the line? How many players did we make their lives yeah. very you know, I uncomfortable? Found, I'm not blowing smoke. I always try to tell my guys, if you go on, it'll be better than not going on. You know, confront the problem or talk about it. And most of my guys did. There was yeah. the occasional crazy. Like, like well, Jackie McReynolds came on and blew it up. Yes. When she came on. Uh, and this is a long time ago, so people might not remember, but Jay does. Jackie McReynolds wanted to come on and defend. She heard Dog and I knocking Kevin. Right. And she made it a hundred times worse because she basically said, well, he leaves before the game's over. Yeah. Because he can't stand the traffic. Yeah. And here he is getting paid a fortune yeah. Yeah. to play left field. Okay, He's not carrying his weight, despite being a very talented player. He was a good player. And... The bottom line is he's leaving early yeah. because he can't stand the traffic yeah. in New York where yeah. people fight for a subway seat, where people battle every day just to feed their family. It, does, it never played well. Let's be honest. It was a death knell for McReynolds. Yeah, and, and Greg Jeffries heard him too. But by and large, in this town, if you're honest, go back to the Tim Tuffle story in 86, made the error cost in the game. Uh, game one is here. We stood in front of his locker for, for two hours. That's all it takes. You know, That's all it takes. Listen, this town, if you stand up and you just stand up and say, I'm trying, and you play hard, this town will never have a problem with you. you had never a good, have a problem you. With had a you. good relationship with Terry, you know, Carl. Love Terry. Do you Love see a Terry. little, little Buck and Terry, Terry and Buck? I'll tell you, I think, I think Terry was so underrated. And when people talk about that Terry was a bad manager, nonsense. Terry was, and you know this, Terry, first of all, I had heard nightmares about him before he, when he became manager. I heard from other teams, right. oh, guy's the worst guy in the world. But he was the best guy that ever came down the pike. I loved him. He's one of my all-time yeah. favorite managers ever in this town. The guy was the best guy. He handled the media great. He was completely honest. And you know what? He got a bad rap here. He did a great job. Do you he remember really what did. time? You probably don't remember this. One press conference, there was an injury he forgot to tell. And I'm saying, Terry, Terry, we got to mention this. Well, the puppy dog is speaking from the back. And, you know, 
And I, I, I had a good relationship with Terry. You called me, you wanted to rip Terry on the air. I said, listen, Terry and I go back a long way. He didn't mean anything by it, you know. And, uh, but he was, he was the best. I love Terry. I'm telling you, I, I have a great relationship with Terry. Uh, I, I always have. And i tell you something. I thought of guys that surprised me, I would put him at the top of the list for all the years I was here. But here's the thing, folks, that people don't understand. The guy who saved the Mets from getting beat up a thousand times, and I beat the Mets up a million times, but there could have been another million where Jay would call me and say, I need a favor. Don't go crazy on my team today. Here's why. And you saved how many well, guys' well. beatings where you just said, Listen, and if Jay said, do me a favor, I did it because I love Jay. So, if, and Jay was the best because if you ever need anything from Jay, everybody in the media feels this way. Jay, Jay's the most popular guy that ever came down the pike. I, no, I never heard anybody ever say a bad word about Jay. To, in, if you say a bad word about Jay, there's something wrong with you. I mean, Jay was, the, he was more accommodating than anybody could ever be to everybody, players, media, everybody. And that's why everybody loved you, because well, you were great to everybody. But I always thought you were fair, Mike. You know, you, you, when we played bad, you, you told the story. Yeah, you know, I was rough, but never, I was never personal. Yes, I never wanted never to make it, it personal. Never, um, made, never made it personal. And, and I thought, for the most part, the, fan, the players were, you know, I had... I never wanted to try to have relationships with, I, I had relationships with coaches, some very close. I never tried to have relationships with players. I had a couple of players, and a couple of them grew into my favorites, like Bernie Williams became a favorite of mine. Uh, I outwardly rooted for him, but it wasn't like he ever asked for anything or there was anything going on, and we weren't even that close, really. I just always liked him, and, I, and Andy Pettit was the same way. Uh, just great guys. I was. I never tried to be that close to the players, but very few players I had a problem with. Now there there was a couple through the years. I mean, let's be honest, that I had some big problems with, uh, but it was rare. It really was. It was really more other sports. I you know because I had a big problem with Strahan. Shocky. I seem to have a lot of trouble with the Giants. Giants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I fought, and, that, and I was a Giant fan. I fought with the Giants players a lot. It just seemed through the years. Uh, and, and some of the bigger ones, too. I mean, you know, Shockey, I drove Shockey insane. He was so mad about me, it was crazy. Uh, it was, uh, he, he used to get up in a press conference and start assaulting me and just go on for 20 minutes well, about I mean, me. You, you know you're mad, right? Yeah. Mike, Mike let me ask you, two years of passage since you left that game. Do you miss the, the daily grind of it all? I do. You know, it's funny. I, I left in 17, and I thought I was done completely. I, I, I would never be back, not one day. They, they had new ownership. They were uncomfortable that they never really got a chance to talk to me. They talked me into coming back. It wasn't the same because I wasn't doing the same schedule. I was only working half as much. I, I probably shouldn't have done it. I did. You know, it wasn't my plan. They really asked me to do it. Uh, in retrospect, I wish I didn't come back, to be honest with you, because it just never felt the same to me after I left. I left perfectly. It was great. I had a great swan song. I should have left in 17 and stayed out. Instead, I came back for that short time uh, for another year, but it wasn't the same. And since I've been gone, I do miss it. I, there, there are days where I just would love to have the ability to get on there and yell and scream and, 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 and do the things uh, like that. I'm doing, I hadn't done anything for two years. I, hadn't, I, I had done maybe three interviews in two years, maybe four. I did one with you. I did uh, a couple of guys when they retired. I did Benigno when he retired. I did uh, Steve Summers when he retired. I hadn't been on the air in years. I've only been on the fan like twice in the last three years, uh, and, and I have no intention of going on there. Uh, just because I, I think my time's done. I was there. I was on all the time. I was on, four, you know, almost 40 hours a week. I was on, you know, as much as you could possibly be on. Now it's somebody else's time. I really believe that. I, it's someone else's time now. It's someone else's fan. We had our run. It's like being a player here. You know what? When your career's over, maybe you're lucky enough to have a, a statue. Maybe you go to the Hall of Fame. Okay? Mike Piazza, Tom Siva. Tom Seaver deserves a statue. Mike Piazza deserves whatever he gets. All right, I've been lucky enough to go to the Hall of Fame. Uh, I, I don't need anything else. I've had, you know, great success, and I, I got great, you know, 
recognition for it. I, I feel very uh, positive about that. So my time's over. It's somebody else's fan now, and that's how I feel but about it. But you do it. have a podcast, Mike. The great, I do. Great Rivers. I just started doing it with Bet Rivers. You know these companies? Bet Rivers, Bet Rivers uh, is one of the six companies that takes bets in New York on, right. online. Um, they're, a, they're a company out of Chicago uh, that um, operates under a couple different names, but in New York it's BetRivers.com. Um, they came after me and they said, we just want you to do some commercials for us and do two podcasts a week. And I said, sounds reasonable. They paid me well for it. So I, I started doing it. I've had fun doing it. I, I, I really have. Uh, it's gone very well. I've done maybe six or eight. And then they signed Valentine. So now during the baseball season, I have Bobby with me for a segment every right. week. Uh, during the football season, there's a bunch of guys. They signed Mike Ditka. They signed Mark Slareth. Uh, so I can use their guys during the football season. I'll do a preview show, and then I'll do one that is whatever, you know, whatever uh, grabs me that week, whatever's going on. Uh, but you know what? I watch the baseball teams day to day. I watch the Yankees and the Mets, uh, and I always loved reacting after that classic game, especially that classic loss, because yes. the classic loss is so much better than the classic yeah. win, because the negative sells, and you know, if you're going to come on and say, hey, weren't they great today, wasn't the reliever great, wasn't that a great three-run home run in the ninth, that's fine, but that's two sentences. When it's a loss, yeah. you can replay everything in your mind over and over and second guess, and those are, those are juicy. The losses are, new, are really juicy. Mike, your career, you weren't really born with a silver spoon in your mouth. No, you, no. You started working for college newsletter, you worked in CBS as a researcher, and to, to, where you became, you know, 2000, you won the Marconi Award, number one uh, radio guy for a couple of years. I mean, you got to be where you came from. People think, well, you had a rich father, you oh, God. had connections. Oh, God, I have a father. You know. uh, I came up, um, we were poor. I mean, I had two brothers, my mother, my father took off. I mean, it's pretty well documented when I, when I was a little boy, uh, left us pretty destitute. Uh, we kind of figured it out after that. My mother worked. I was a latchkey kid. I mean, I had my brother John, who's still here uh, and is retired. He was six years older than me. He kind of raised us. He didn't have to stay around, but he did. Uh, and then my younger brother, who's gone, was uh, 20 months younger than me. Uh, we were kind of latchkey kids. John worked. My mother worked. They didn't come home till like 10 o'clock at night. And we came home after school, you know, when we weren't at, at practice or on teams. And we, you know, eat dinner, it was on the stove, heated up, that kind of thing. So I was one of the original latchkey kids when I was a little kid. Grew up in Long Beach on Long Island. Um, you know, put myself through college. Went to St. John's. Um, went into athletic administration and communications. I didn't grow up wanting to be... A broadcaster, I was never a play-by-play -play guy. Um, I was editing a football magazine. I did some freelance writing on college basketball that got noticed by CBS Sports, a guy named Kevin O'Malley, who later on was an executive with Turner. They brought me in to work on college basketball and college football at CBS. I hit it off with Brent Musburger. I became his kind of right-hand guy and his information guy. Um, then Jim Nance came along, and I broke him into the business, became his right-hand guy for years. Then CBS decided during the NCAA tournament, we're going to put you on the air. The first show I ever did as a broadcaster was Sal Marciano's show on ESPN. He had an interview I show. That. Channel that? 11 in New York, yeah. Sal Marciano had an interview show. He used to put me on as a guest. Um, I did that show. Then uh, CBS put me on. And then FAN came out of nowhere, and I couldn't even get an interview with the FAN. I couldn't even get an interview. I said, I went in, I finally get an interview. They look at my resume, and they said, you're overqualified. Why do you want to be a producer? I said, I don't want to be a producer. I said, I work at CBS. They said, we know that. We, you're overqualified to be a producer for on the radio. And I said, I don't want to be a radio producer. I want to have a show. And they said, what are you kidding? We're bringing in Pete Franklin, Jim Lampley. We're bringing in the biggest guys in the country. You got no chance to ever do a show here. I said, well, how about you give me a chance? Nope. I asked them like 20 times. They really? turned me down like 20 times. Wow. Finally, 
I had worked with Jim Nance. I had broke him in the business with CBS. He had won a contest to come and do college football studio show, and then it took off and he became this big star. He had worked with a guy who was, at, was working as a producer at the original FAN, a guy named Luke Griffin. Now they fired everybody about six months in, but Luke was still there at the time. Jim Nance called Luke Griffin and said, give him a chance. You're gonna like him, give him a chance. They gave me a weekend show with a guy named Dan Lovett, who they used to fly in. Think about FAN. FAN early on used to fly in people to do all their weekend shows, fly them in from other places really? around the country wow. to work on the weekend. They used to fly update people in. I mean, the cost was ridiculous. It was so crazy run. It was, not, it was run nationally and not run locally. Well, then someone realized, we've got to get local guys on. All of a sudden... Pete Franklin starts taking ill. I go in, I'm doing a weekend show. They say to me, hey, give us your number. We might need you as a fill-in. Pete Franklin gets sick, they put me in for Pete Franklin. Little did I know I did well. They got good response. They didn't tell me that, though. And then they put me in for him for three weeks in the summertime. And they said, hey, you know, we think you got a future here. I didn't know at the time. I was doing well in the ratings, but I didn't even know what the ratings were. They never told I you? No, and I didn't know. They never told me. Well, then they come to me and say, listen, it's your big day. Pete's not coming back. He's ill. We need a new afternoon drive show. You're in the afternoon drive. I'm like, thank you, thank you. Th this is my greatest day of my life. Uh, no. We have an idea for a show, though. Mike and the Mad Dog. I'm like, no way. I don't even know this guy. He you had never just, met him before? I'd never met him. He had just started coming in. He was working as a fill-in guy on MCA. He had gotten fired in Orlando. He was doing fill-in work on WMCA. Bernard McGurk, who was Don Imus' producer, yeah. heard him, put him on the Imus show. Here he is, this crazy guy yelling and screaming. Imus liked him. Next thing you know, he's doing fill-in shows on the fan. And a guy, Mark Mason, who was the guy who ran the station at the time, the executive producer, and this became his claim to fame in his life, he said, I got this idea. I'm going to do this show, Mike and the Mad Dog. A lot of people said, no way will it work. I was against it. Dog didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. But they said to me, you either do it or you're not getting a chance to go to afternoon drive. That's it. This is it. Take it or leave it. Well, heck, I wasn't going to leave it. I mean, sure. plus, just to show you how it became, I became pretty good at negotiating years later and did very well financially. Early on, they told me, here's your offer. Take it or leave it. That's how they told me for my salary, too. Here's your salary. Really? They ripped my contract up in two months, though, and gave me a new one. It only lasted two months. They gave me a three-year deal, a hundred, a hundred and ten, a hundred and twenty thousand dollars $120,000, which was less than I was making at CBS. Re really? But I took it. And hey, I was gonna take anything to get a chance. But Dog and I hit it so big so fast, they ripped the contracts up within three months and gave us five year deals. Like, there was all this talk about a possible reunion of company. Was it, it, it ever? No, it never did. First of all, the biggest thing, Jay, is now Dog left. I didn't, it wasn't my decision, it was Dog's decision. He probably was sick of me. We did 20 years together. He decided he wanted to do something else. It was his decision. Okay, I stayed, did very well at FAN. He's gone on his own thing and done very well for himself. Uh, so we've been apart now almost as long as we were together. We were together right. 20 years. We've been apart now since 2008. So now you're, now you're 14 years we've been apart. It's almost as long. So, and I did from 2008 in August till 2017 by myself came back and did a little longer and then left again. So I did about 12, 11 years, almost 12 years by myself. Um, the bottom line was uh, we had 20 great years together. We hit it off. Uh, the show was a huge success. We got a ton of money. Uh, we had, we had the, as you know, Jay, we had the world as our oyster. We were like the kings of the city in those days. People, how did you always get, the, the, whatever happened the night before, always to tune on your show, he was, on the, he was a guest on well, the show. Well, that was it. Uh, Jay, we... we uh, never uh, missed anybody. You know, and now it's hard to get guests because 
A, there's a lot of different places guys can work now. There's a million different right. places. B, a lot of coaches now have their own shows. Right. Uh, in those days, it wasn't the case. There was nobody that ever turned the Mike and the Mad Dog show down. Ever. ever. I, never. I don't remember. Any, the only guy that turned us down who we couldn't get on the show was Joe DiMaggio. Really? We tried. We even asked Ted Williams to ask for us. Really? But yes, we had Ted Williams on, and we said, Ted, we can't get Joe. I'll ask Joe. He asked Joe. Joe said no. Really? I had a, a mutual friend. Uh, you know him, Hank Goldberg down right. in, in Miami. Miami, right. I'll ask him. Joe and I are tight, okay? No. Never would do the show. The one guy, Dog, and I always wanted to interview was him. I interviewed Mickey Mantle, interviewed everybody, but I could not get Joe DiMaggio. Always yeah. wanted him. But, you know, it, it, we got every guest. No, it was never an issue. We always, we were the show. No question. It was nothing else. Remember, there wasn't internet. Yeah. There yeah. wasn't, people didn't have cell phones. You know, it, it, we were hit it at the, you know, sometimes you hit things at the right time. We were a great show. And we had great chemistry. And I think we're the best show ever. Most people agree. No question. I the agree. bottom line, though, is we also hit everything at the per you got to be in the right mm -hmm. place at the right time. We were in the right place at the right time, and that's what made a lot of the difference. Well, if you're a betting man, what's your odds on a Subway World Series again? What do you think? I don't think it'll happen. I think it's too hard. I think it's so hard to win in the postseason now. You got a lot of layers of playoffs, you got a lot of opportunities to lose. Um, there's a lot of a lot of things have to go right. You know, you build a team that's a good team. And the Yankees have done that a lot of years. Look at the Yankees. The Yankees, we watch them. We lived through those great teams of the 90s, okay, into 2000, where they won, you know, you know, forced, they, won, they won really were there every year. They won World Series after World Series. They won... Countless World Series games, in a, 14 World Series games in a row. I mean, they did crazy things. It's so difficult. Look at it now. The Yankees have been in one World Series in 20 years. Right. It's very it, – you can make the playoffs. The Mets are going to make the playoffs this year. There's not any question about that. And they're going to have a good chance because if they have a healthy DeGrom and Scherzer, they got a great chance with a good manager. But – they're going to have to get the ball to bounce yeah. right. You know that. The yeah. ball can bounce the wrong way in one game, and you're, not, and you're not going to get there. You need to be a little lucky in the postseason. Yeah. Mike, last thing, I know you're going to be bringing this up, but I went through, through the years. Anytime I had a charity thing, you were oh, always there for me. Yeah, no, 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 no. Stop. I, I, I kind of said publicly, stop. on the year, this gruff guy, but when my dear Shannon Ford passed away, thousands upon hundreds of thousands of dollars at tables, you're always there. Uh, any other charity, you're always there for me, Mike. I never forgot, so I just wanted to... Say, I appreciate it. Well, Jay, you know, um, I didn't know her very well, and she obviously had a very big impact on the Mets and on you and on a lot of people. But, you know, you were so, you were so passionate and did so much for that family and for her memory. You know, you should be commended for it. You know, if you, all you're asking me to do is write a check, well, and thank God I can do that. Yeah, I mean, but the bottom line is, stuff, you, know, you know, yeah, but that's okay. Yeah, right. I, I, you know, that, that's fine. You, did, you were the one doing the work. Well, you know, when someone just asked me to make a donation, that's the easy part. You were the one who put well, in the work, and you, and you did a great job. You really did. I know she meant a lot to you, and uh, she had a big impact on a lot of people, and uh, I know she'll always be remembered here, but uh, you did a great job with her and, and her family. And, 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 you know, and let me say this. Because, you know, uh, I get asked to do a lot of podcasts. I don't do a whole lot of them, you know. Uh, but I would always come do it for you because, you know what, anything I ever asked, if I ever asked Jay anything, he was always there, wow. front row. The amazing thing about Jay is what people don't realize is he did everything for every player. When, when, when Carlos Delgado's father needed tickets. Yeah. Mike, you got to get Carlos Delgado's <laughs> tickets for that. his father. I said, Jay, come on. No, for, I said, Delgado's father? <laughs> okay. Didn't uh, matter what player. Right, you did more for right. those players. They should build a with, statue to you out well, there. You know that? I did a quiz of love. But thank you for your time. You're a good friend. I appreciate, uh, anytime. I appreciate our friendship through the years. Good Mike. luck with the uh, podcast. And let me say congratulations to one of the guys who was a big part of the Mike and the Mad dog show, Bob Usler. We called him Mr. Met. You know, Mrs. Met, uh, my mother-in-law, 
Mrs. Rosemary O'Connor, who we, I called Mrs. Met. She loved the Mets more than anything. Jay did everything for her, gave her everything, let her help her meet the players. She loved Mike Piazza because he was religious. Right. That's the reason she loved him, yeah. because he was religious. Um, you know, you were so nice whenever I'd bring her to spring training. She got the oh, got pictures with everybody. Omar loved her too. Uh, she would bake brownies for everybody and for Omar. Nice lady. But you know, she she passed away last December, so it was a big loss for my wife and for the family. Uh, and now, Mr. Met, this is what I call Bob Usler, who is the most passionate, crazy Met fan. As the we had two main update guys, the Mink Man. And, Ms. and Bob Usler, who's been at the fan 30 years. Tomorrow's his last day. So I wanted to you know, uh, say congratulations to Bob, who was a big part of our show and has always been Mr. Met to a big part of this city. He's a good man. Yes, he is. Again, Michael, thank you for your time. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, thank Michael. You. Appreciate it.